A very, a very uh, A green new issue. I guess uh, in the league. Kid made a fortune of Galer. Could you ask all the hair in Galiv? Er an Tranona Varesha. Er an Akut Stadwil Shah. Mayor of Galway. Uh, ministers, uh, ambassadors, bishops, and all guests. You're all very welcome to National University of Ireland, Galway here this on this beautiful evening. Um, we are on this historic occasion uh, for the university when it has the honour of conferring an honorary Doctor of Law degrees on former South African President and Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Mr. Nelson Mandela. My name is John Sweeney, Director of Planning and Administration in the Office of the President here in NUI Galway. And before the arrival of the academic procession uh, and the commencement of the ceremony, I wish in the interest of your personal safety to draw your attention to the location of the emergency exits in this hall. Now we have a total of five emergency exits. Uh, a bank of doors here to my left. Uh, there's a door here marked door A over to my right. Further door down in the, in, on my right hand side at the back of the hall. There's a door here to my left, my left hand side at the bottom of the hall. And of course the bank of doors through which you entered. In the event of an emergency, uh, which it will be signalled by a continuous ringing of an alarm. Our stewards in the hall will assist with the orderly evacuation of the hall. And you will be escorted back to your seats when it is safe to do so. May I remind you that this is also a no smoking zone. And we would oblige if those of you who have mobile phones with you, if you would please ensure that they are switched off for the duration of the ceremony. On this occasion also, I have been asked to point out that, the, that flash photography is strictly prohibited in this hall. So we'd ask you to bear that in mind, please. No flash photography in the hall. The order of today's ceremony is as printed on the brochures provided on your seats. As the academic pr procession retires at the end of the ceremony, guests are asked to join it in order, beginning with the front rows, and our stewards will assist with that task. So we want to empty the hall in an orderly fashion at the end of the ceremony as well. Now you will be able to watch the arrival of Mr. Mandela, and I'm not sure whether, yes, it's just about happening here now as I speak, and the very colorful academic procession on the screen here in the hall. We are also relaying the ceremony live to three other screens on the campus where 500 people will be seated to watch the ceremony. To mark this historic event, NUI Galway and HEA Net will host the first ever live webcast from this campus. This will enable alumni, staff and friends from all over the globe to enjoy this auspicious occasion as it happens. The University wishes to acknowledge the assistance it has received in the planning and organization of today's historic event from many sources, but particularly from Mr. Mandela's office, from Her Excellency the South African Ambassador and from her ex embassy staff, and of course from the Garda Shikana. It is our wish here at NUI Galway that you enjoy this historic occasion and that you have a very pleasant here, evening here with us in the University.
a chancellor in the Hulskala, a Vera in the Galiva, a Cholachaha, a Korja, agus a Usul Mandela. Her Kyonolskal na Heron Galiv, Faram Fearclean Falcha, Rugak Thinagiv, her no card star will shot, in a Willoskal na Heron Galiv, a Brona Kem Inig, her Vina Devur Iguri na Linisha, Nelson Mandela. On behalf of National University of Ireland Galway, I welcome each and every one of you to this historic occasion when the university confers its highest honour on one of the wor greatest world leaders of all time, Nelson Mandela. Like me, I am sure that everyone here today is deeply conscious of the significance of this event, probably the most prestigious conferring ever to take place in this university. Before proceeding with the formal ceremony, you will all appreciate that an event like this does not occur on its own. And I would like to acknowledge now the enormous efforts of many of our staff in the organization of this day. I know that all the work was done voluntarily, happily, enthusiastically, indeed with pleasure, by the people involved. But I do feel, however, that I should publicly acknowledge the long and stressful hours put in by so many of our staff. They know who they are. I won't name them this evening. But on my own behalf, on behalf of Oskar Nehren Galiv, for dedication far beyond the call of duty, Gurav Mil Mahagav Galer, Agus Irmsha Nish Arvsha, and Lok Deshita, Bula Bas Moor, a Hort Krishnadina Shem. This event this evening is also going out live on our first ever live webcast from the campus. So I would like to take this opportunity also to greet our alumni and friends all over the world who may be watching. Falterov Awalia, or welcome home on this historic day. And now I call on the Registrar of the National University of Ireland, Dr. John Nolan, to commence the formal part of our proceedings. Dr. Nolan. Universitas Habernii Nationalis, Prionorabilis Cancellare Totaca Universitas, I Committee Universitaria Hodia Convocata Sunt, Ot Hic Vir Maxime Eximius, Ad Gradum Academicum Ad Matator, Doctoratus in Utroque Uri, Dr. Ignor Jumurkertig, Pro Vice Cancellarius, Presentabit Nelson Mandela. A Chancellor of Winter and Hulskale, Agus Akorja, Ochin is Och Hunger. On our Askwimsha, the Nolskal Shahe, on Tukdron Nelson Mandela, a Venar Mask in Yov, Agus Eved the Frivilege Aguin, came inig Doctorukta of Runair, Fall Timid Ochri Rot, a Uktoran. Conferral of an honorary doctorate is one of the university's most solemn occasions a moment when we associate the accomplishments of an extraordinary individual with our institution. There is always a degree of reciprocity in the procedure, although never in our history has it been so evident as it is today. For today, it is Nelson Mandela who honours the National University of Ireland Galway, and we thank him most sincerely for his presence with us. I was very much looking forward to meeting with Nelson Mandela today, and having had the privilege of talking, uh, and talking to him for a few minutes, president to president, so to speak. <laughs> but I've been told, <laughs> thank you. But I've been told that he doesn't like to be called president really now that he's moved on from that job. And he really likes to be called Tata, which is, means grandfather in his native Hosa language. And everybody in South Africa knows him as Tata, a term of affection and endearment. And so if you will forgive me for being so presumptuous and familiar, may I say to you, welcome to Galway, Tata. There is little that I can say that most of you do not already know about this remarkable man. 
Nobel Peace Prize laureate and the first president of democratic South Africa, Nelson Mandela is the human rights icon of the 20th century. After spending much of his life in prison for his activities to bring to an end the apartheid regime, his release in early 1990 unleashed an irreversible process. His legacy and spirit continue to drive reform and change, not only in South Africa itself, but throughout the entire continent. As long-suffering Africa wrestles with the enduring legacies of the slave trade, European colonialism, and the miseries of neoliberalism and globalization, Nelson Mandela provides a ray of hope and optimism in what is otherwise a rather bleak landscape. His visit here also gives us the opportunity to affirm our commitment to and solidarity with the people of Africa. In, answer, in honoring Nelson Mandela here today, we salute not just Mr. Mandela, not just the leaders of his and other liberation movements, but all those who have been part of this epic and unending struggle for liberty and liberation. We salute also the many of our own fellow countrymen, educators, doctors, missionaries, and indeed present-day Irish aid workers, many of whom are represented here today, who have given so much of themselves to assist the destitute and the oppressed in the continent of Africa. And I personally remember an Irish priest, Father James Lynch, who was from my father's village in County Kerry, and in whose school another great African leader, President Julius Nereri of Tanzania, sheltered as an assistant teacher, or Mulam, Mulimu, as he was known in Swahili, while he led his country to independence from colonial rule. Nelson Mandela is perhaps the world's most celebrated political prisoner of all time. And he just has to feel welcome in a country that has known its share of political prisoners. When the writer Frank O'Connor was imprisoned here in the early 1920s, he said that for an Irishman to say, he and I were in jail together, was rather like an Englishman saying, he and I were in Eton together, <laughs> but considerably more classy. And it doesn't get any classier than Robben Island. Nelson Mandela was sent to Robben Island in 1963, the year in which, as it happens, the General Assembly adopted the Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. This declaration was followed two years later by the International Convention on the same subject, now one of the most widely ratified human rights instruments and one of the premier documents in international law. Prohibition of racial discrimination sits very much at the core of modern human rights. It weaves together historical strands, such as revulsion at colonialism and the slave trade, as well as some of the more egregious modern manifestations, apartheid, the Holocaust, and segregation in the deep south of the United States. The visit to Ireland of Nelson Mandela and the ongoing engagements of some of his comrades, for example, Sir Ramaphosa, who is with us this evening and whom we warm, warmly welcome in our midst, and Kader Asmal, who will be with us here next week when we confer on him also an honorary degree, they continue to assist our country as it struggles with the demons of racism. Under Nelson Mandela's guidance, South Africa is striving to create an egalitarian, pluralist society, a vision upon which he has steadfastly insisted since the earliest days of his political life. Post-apartheid South Africa, under Nelson Mandela's stewardship, has explored innovative methods of dealing with past violations of human rights. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has insisted upon accountability as well as reparation, but without an inordinate, inordinate focus on the harshness of criminal punishment. The Constitutional Court that Mandela appointed early in 1995 in one of its first acts abolished the death penalty. Nelson Mandela reminds us constantly of the significance of personal leadership. Without his presence, it is easy to imagine South Africa plunged into turmoil. Many countries are in almost constant crisis because they lack men and women of his stature, integrity, and judgment. He stepped down as president of South Africa, but not without leaving a dynamic, competent team in place to ensure that the legacy of the work that he and his colleagues had initiated would continue. Nelson Mandela has since become the world's quintessential elder statesman, 
His influence is felt around the world as he continues to weigh in on controversial matters, be it condemnation of the aggression against Iraq or the urgency of measures to deal with the modern HIV-AIDS plague on his own continent. Dr. Mandela, your name will be forever henceforth linked with our university. We want you to know that this is, this is much more than mere symbolism, that your visit helps cement a genuine commitment and engagement of our institution here in Galway to the ideas and values that have shaped your life. As the early years of the new century unfold, the need for such inspiration as you have given is, if anything, greater than ever before. Your visit to Galway today gives us a renewed inspiration to tackle the inequities that are still, unfortunately, all too pervasive in our world. It serves to highlight how individual resolve and adherence to principle, combined with tenacity and courage, can change the course of history. For tending and propagating the flame of liberty, humanity is everywhere in your debt. And in conclusion, I would like, if I may, to quote the last paragraph of your wonderful, awe-inspiring book, Long Walk to Freedom, because it sums up, in my view, so beautifully and yet so modestly, the story of your life to date. And I quote, I have walked that long walk to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way. But I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds there are many more hills to be climbed. I have taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come. But I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom come responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not yet ended." Unquote. Tata, we are so pleased and so honoured to be now and forevermore a part, however modest, of that long walk. We have a greeting in Irish, our native language, which says, Gunairi on Bohorla, which roughly translated means, may the road rise with you. There is no doubt but that the road of your long walk to freedom has risen not only with you, but also for millions of others of the oppressed and dispossessed of the world we live in. Faltimi Dorishinyov, Markemi Darnolskal, Rivdine de Vur Lechra Nalinisha, on Tosal Nelson Mandela. Pray Honorabilis Cancellari, Totaque Universitas. Presento Vobus, Honk Meum Filium. Quem Scio Tam Moribus, Quam Doctrina Habilum, Et Idonium Esse, Qui Admitator, Honoris Causa, Ad Gradum. Dr. Atos in Utroque Jure, Tam Civili Quam Canonico, Itque Tibi Fide, Mea Tester, Expondeo Totique Academiae.
and I now know what you're all waiting for, and I call on the man of the moment, Tata, to address us. Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, President, members of the university, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Before I read my formal speech, I wanted to correct a misconception of thinking that what is described as a miracle in South Africa was not the achievement of one man, especially an old man of my age. It was collective, and I'm happy that uh, one of the main architects of that uh, collective effort is amongst us. This is Cyril Ramaphosa. <clears throat> When the National Executive Committee of the ruling party said he should lead our delegation uh, to what we call the Cordessa, where all the political parties were going to discuss the future of South Africa, I oppose that, not because of his lack of competence but because we have just appointed him as the Secretary General of the ANC. But uh, young pe people and radicals overruled me. And I said, well, you are unanimous and I'm all alone. And uh, I must uh, submit to the majority. All right, he went and to the negotiating forum, which we call Contessa. Hardly three months thereafter, they said he must come back because the organization was falling into pieces. I sat over my dead body. <laughs> I warned you, I warned you that this is going to happen. You were stubborn. You overruled me. Now, the young man has made a great impact in Cordessa, uh, in which uh, he got the support of both friends and foe. Now, having made that achievement, you say he must come back, you will do so over my dead body. <clears throat> and I refused. I am a, a person who is guided by the majority, but I choose when I should obey my jo the majority and when the majority must obey me. <laughs> <laughs> and in this case, <laughs> and in this case, I rejected their appeal and he led our negotiation team and he is responsible for what is regarded by many people as a miracle. This is the man who is the architect of that miracle. <clears throat> but coming to Ireland, 
is always a very pleasurable experience. Not only is this one of the most beautiful countries I have had the privilege of visiting, it is also inhabited by people whose friendliness and hospitality seem inborn and natural. In few other places in the world is one made to feel so immediately welcome and at home. Thank you for once more receiving us in the Republic of Ireland and for the warmth and spontaneity with which we are met from the moment of our arrival. With remember, we remember with, the warm, with warm admiration from our reading of Irish history, the ancient traditions of scholarships and learning on this island. When large parts of Europe were still languishing in ignorance and backwardness, there were centers of learning in Ireland attracting scholars from far and wide. It is therefore a source of great pride to be honored by an Irish university. To stand here at the National University of Ireland and Galway receive an honorary doctorate makes one feel part of that proud lineage of scholarship, learning, and wisdom that had been passed down the centuries of Irish history. <clears throat> we thank the university for admitting us into its ranks of alumni and making us an honorary member of that proud Irish tradition. We shall cherish this honor. <clears throat> oh, I thought, uh, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> this is the disadvantage of inviting a man who is more than 100 years old. <laughs> to deliver an address at such a famous university. I hope this is the last time you'll do it. <laughs> we thank the university for admitting us into its ranks of alumni and making us an honorary member of that proud Irish tradition. We shall cherish this honor together with other fond memories we have of Ireland and the Irish people. One of the trustees of my foundation, Minister Kada Asmar, will receive an honorary doctorate from this institute next week. Apart from remembering Minister Asmal as Minister of Water Affairs and Forestry in our first cabinet, and as the one who walked the entire country up to the importance of water in national affairs, we of course know him for his long and deep connection with Ireland. He spent uh, most of his years in exile here in this country, where he excelled as a teacher, counting amongst his former students some famous Irish citizens. He also reminds us of the solidarity of the Irish people with the suffering, suffering mass, masses of South Africa during the anti-apartheid struggle. The Irish rank with the Dutch and Scandinavians 
as the leading Western nations in the anti-apartheid solidarity movement. We cannot explain fully in simple words how much inspiration we drew from the support of the Irish anti-apartheid movement. It is for that reason that we take such special pride in being honored by an Irish institution of higher learning. We humbly accept this award also on behalf of the people of South Africa who would wish me, wish me to convey their thanks and appreciation for your support to our struggle at a time when it was not fashionable to demonstrate such support in the manner that you did. We do this not only on behalf of the masses of South Africans that suffered so severely under the cruelty and injustice of apartheid. We do so on behalf of all South Africans who now live in a non-racial and democratic South Africa. The defeat of apartheid and the transition to democracy could not have been achieved, <coughs> excuse me, could not have been achieved in the manner it occurred without the support of the international community. Thank you. All South Africans today share in the fruits of your contribution and would thank you for helping to achieve a nationhood that is inclusive and provides a place for all its people. With me on this trip, as I have said, is another South African of renown, Cyril Ramaphosa. He was the chief negotiator on our side during the talks with the apartheid regime. Thereafter, he became the chairperson of our constitutional assembly that negotiated the final constitution for a democratic South Africa. Like Hekata Asmal, Cyril Ramaphosa also has some connection with broader Ireland, having played an oversight role in aspects of the search for peace in Northern Ireland. <coughs> His presence here, hopefully, also demonstrates our support for the search for lasting peace in Northern Ireland and reconciliation amongst all the people of Ireland. Our own experience in South Africa, where we confounded the purpose of doom and achieved a peaceful settlement, inspires us to believe that no situation can be so intractable that it cannot be solved through negotiations and the willingness to compromise. <clears throat> the world is now in greater need than ever for men and women of peace to stand up and let their voices be heard and their commitment felt. One should not allow yourself to fall too easily into alarmist readings of any epoch or period, but there are worrying signs of increasing unilateralism on the part of some nations or groups of nations. We have not heard any reasonable voice in the world defending Saddam Hussein and his regime. The chorus of protest against the war in Iraq was directed towards the, the unilateral action taken and the disregard for the organs of multilateral governance, particularly the United Nations. Let us hope that as the League of Nations and the United Nations Organization grew out of the urgent recognition for multilateralism after a period 
of destructive conflict, sanity will once more prevail in the wake of the war in Iraq. We cannot allow <clears throat> We cannot allow the world to again degenerate into a place where the will of the powerful dominates over all other considerations. That will surely prove to be a recipe for growing anarchy in world affairs. The war in Iraq has created a challenge to the United Nations to reassert its role and place in world governance. All men and women of peace, all leaders committed to the ideal of world peace, all governments who seek democracy within and amongst nations should rededicate themselves to the strengthening and, if needs be, restructuring of our world body and other multilateral organs. We cherish our association with this nation and its people. The Republic of Ireland came out of great and often bloody struggle. It stands today as an example of a country that has built a better life for its people on the foundations of the peace and stability that developed within the Republic. <clears throat> I remember how shrewd, how wise one of your public figures was. Wow. Bernard Shaw, you will know all the stories about him. How a young lady went to him and said, uh, Mr. Shaw, we should get married. The baby will have your brains and my beautiful figure. <laughs> and Bernard Shaw says, dear lady, what happens if the baby has my figure <coughs> and your brains? <laughs> well, he said many other things, but uh, we want uh, world peace. We do not want uh, to offend any country. But many of you will know that somebody <coughs> uh, went to him and said, uh, by the way, what is the name of this famous lady? And uh, Bernard Shaw says, which famous lady? The one who's deaf and dumb. And he mentioned the country from which he came. He said all members of that country, and he mentioned by name, are deaf and dumb. <coughs> But we're not going to repeat that because we want world peace. <laughs> we want unity. But we thank you once more for the honor you have done us today. Let us together hope and work for a world in which there will be peace and on the basis of that peace, the building of a more prosperous life for all the people of the world. <clears throat> but it is correct for me in the Republic of Ireland to say we expect you to stand up for multilateralism because there are people today who think they can dictate to the world. They can dictate it to certain states. That is a lack of vision and a lack of depth. We must stand up and condemn that 
uncompromisingly because no single country, however strong, can dictate to the entire world and leave <laughs> the United Nations is an idea of uh, Winston Churchill, one of the famous uh, British leaders, as well as President Roosevelt. They suggested that this body must be created so that uh, there should be a body which is going to promote world peace in the world. And those of us who are connected either because we followed the wisdom of Winston Churchill and uh, President Roosevelt must stand up and condemn any unilateral action of people without a vision, without a depth of thinking, now to dictate it to the world and uh, without the United Nations. The actions that have been taken, the actions that have been taken against Iraq are completely inexcusable if taken outside the United Nations. If the United Nations had been approached and they took the action, I would have supported them 100%. But what I've condemned is a single nation that can dictate to other countries, go to war, destroy the buildings and the innocent human beings, men, women, children, the aged, and the disabled, and still we thank them as the leaders of the world. We must condemn them in the stronger stance. If you don't stand up and condemn what is wrong, there are many people who are listening and watching what is happening today, and they are going to do the same thing. Organizations like the United Nations, which were formed to promote peace, are going to be irrelevant. As you know, the First World War broke out in 1914 and ended in 1918. The Second World War broke out in 1939 and ended in 1945. We know who caused those two wars. But since 1945, there has been no world war. Indeed, there have been a civil strife and conflict between two nations, but there has been no world war because of the United Nations. And any organization, any country, any leader that now decides to sideline the United Nations that country and its leader are a danger to the world, and they do stand. <laughs> and they do so because you are keeping quiet. You are afraid of this country and its leader. You say if you take an independent stand, you will not be able to get support from it. Many of us have got support from, from the leader of that country. But when he made a mistake and sidelined the United Nations, 
we could not be silenced by the help that he gave us. We immediately stood up and condemned him. When I was negotiating in Burundi, I needed money, and I asked him for $5 million, which he gave to me, just as his predecessor, uh, President Clinton, did. And, uh, but when he decided to take this action of acting outside the United Nations, in spite of the help that he gave me, which enabled me to make progress in settling the conflict in Burundi, I could not keep quiet. I immediately condemned him. <laughs> All of us must have the courage to stand up and condemn what is wrong. And uh, I am very grateful that you have allowed an old man who is more, <clears throat> more than 100 years old to come and address you. Thank you very much. We're going to stay standing. We will not come to sit. You'll be going out in a minute. So go stay standing. Okay. Thank you. Some information. Yes. Uh, please, can you give me some information? Yes. Is my friend Tony O'Reilly here? Yes. Uh, will I tell you about about a cross with him? I will indeed. Yeah. I will. <laughs> okay. We'll go out here on this. Thank you. Yeah, okay, you're welcome. Okay. I'll take your hand here.
Thank you.